Every year, hundreds of people go missing inside of national parks and forests all over North America. Of those hundreds, there's always a few that baffle investigators because either they go missing under very strange circumstances, like they were right in front of someone, they were talking to someone, and then you know, in a second they're gone, or where they're discovered doesn't make any sense, that they've covered a distance that is too far for them to have covered, or they're in locations that are just physically impossible to get to. One man is making it his mission to research these very strange disappearances. His name is David Politis. He's a former police detective. He covers all of these cases in his book series called Missing 411. I went out and bought all of them. They're incredible. He has a YouTube channel called the Can-Am Missing Project. That's linked below in the description. And so today I'm gonna share three missing person cases that have all been covered by David Politis in Missing 411. And hopefully by the end of this video, you're just as interested in the Missing 411 phenomenon that David Politis has brought to light. And hopefully you'll go over to his channel, the Can-Am Missing Project, and you'll give them a follow because he has poured tens of thousands of hours into this. Without David Politis, there would be no Missing 411 Project and many people that go missing would just be forgotten about. So shout out to David Politis for keeping their memories alive and keeping the public engaged in something that is truly baffling and needs more attention. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. If that's of interest to you, then please sneak into the like button's house and replace all of their salt shakers with sugar. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. So just a couple of weeks ago, early on July 24th, 2020, an 18-year-old woman named Gia Fuda, who was living with her parents in Seattle, Washington, wakes up in their home, goes downstairs, says good morning to her mother and to her father. She has a sip of a seltzer water, and then she heads out to her car and says, okay, I'll see you tonight, and she drives off. Gia's mother said that because of the quarantine, all of Gia's college classes had been moved online, and Gia didn't like doing all of her work in the house. She felt trapped. And so her routine consisted of getting up early and heading to Bellevue College, which is just outside of Seattle, where she could do some work in their library, do her online courses there, and then come back sometime in the evening. And so Gia's parents assumed that's what she was doing that day. But when Gia left that morning, she did not follow her typical COVID-19 routine of going to Bellevue College to do schoolwork. Instead, she hopped on the highway and she drove 60 miles to a very rural part of Washington State. It's very heavily forested. It's called Index, Washington. And she gets picked up on a camera inside of a coffee shop where she gets a cup of coffee and she buys a Bigfoot keychain and then gets back in her car and drives another 30 miles away from Seattle, away from her parents' home. It's unclear where she's going until her car runs out of gas. And when she ran out of gas, it was like she wasn't prepared for it because she was only able to turn her car and barely pull off of Highway 2. It didn't look like she'd intentionally parked. And it's actually how investigators spotted it because it was jutting out into the road slightly. She gets out and instead of walking on the highway to try to get help or trying to flag down another motorist, she grabs her cell phone, her Bible, and a journal and turns and starts walking directly uphill. There's like this mountain right next to the highway and it's very densely forested. And she just starts walking straight up this mountain. It's important to note that David Politis just recently came out with a video about this case on his Can-Am Missing Project channel. And he says that the area she stopped in is an area where at least a dozen other people have gone missing under baffling circumstances that have all been covered in the Missing 411 phenomenon. By 11.30 that night, Gia's parents were starting to get very concerned that they hadn't heard from their daughter and that she hadn't come home yet. They started texting her and calling her, no answer, no response. 
By 1 a.m., they called the police. So this huge search is launched to go find Gia. Hundreds of volunteers, they have all these professional search and rescue people out there. They have helicopters overhead. And almost immediately, within a few hours of the search being launched, they find her car on Highway 2, but no sign of her anywhere. The area that she was in was actually a dead zone for cell phone service, so they couldn't get in touch with her in part because they had no service. And authorities weren't able to track her phone because there was no cell phone reception. So they didn't have much to work with, except that they generally knew where she might be, which is in this very thick section of the Cascade Mountains. And so for days and days, they're searching and turning up nothing. And unfortunately, as time ticks on, the likelihood of her being found alive is next to zero. But seven days into this huge search where nothing has been turned up, they have this huge find. A couple of the searchers that were miles away from where she had gone missing. I mean, at this point, you're seven days into the search, you have searchers combing miles and miles of territory, and there's nothing, they've found nothing. And these searchers are up near the scenic creek, where there's a little bit of a clearing, there's this creek, and they find in one area, her jacket, her shoes, her phone, her journal, and her Bible, all in one area. It looked like she had just suddenly stripped everything she had, put it on the ground, but she was nowhere to be found. So while this find is certainly great progress towards discovering what happened, it unfortunately sent a message to her parents that at this point, you need to brace for the worst because now your daughter is not only missing and has been for a week, she doesn't have any gear. She has no clothes, she has no phone, she's just gone and has nothing. So the omen was very bad at this point. But her family and the searchers were not willing to give up, so they continued to search this new area where all of her stuff had been found for another two days. And on the ninth day from when she had gone missing, they found her and she was alive. She was sitting on a rock near this creek. When they approached her, she was very startled to see people coming near her. She clearly was not expecting to be found. She was also more or less incoherent. She believed she had only been out for maybe three days and just had gotten lost but they told her she had been gone for nine days. But she was unhurt, she had a couple scratches on her, she was definitely emaciated, but she had been drinking from the stream and, and eating huckleberries, so she was you know, taking care of herself, but she was totally confused. She didn't know why she was there. And when she was pressed a little bit further, she didn't know why she drove where she drove. She doesn't know why she walked up a very steep mountain into the Cascades. She also has no idea what happened over the first six, seven days. She only recalled the last couple and thought that's the whole time she had been out there. So it's a very confusing story and one that probably we will never get a clear answer to. This will just become another one of the thousands of very odd disappearances that occur all over North America, except at least in this case, she was found alive. Tom Mezek was this salty army veteran. He had served in the 82nd Airborne Division, which is an elite paratrooper division. He taught survival training classes, but more than anything, he loved to hunt. And he actually hunted in this one particular area in New York all the time with the same group of friends. In fact, for like 55 years, Tom and his six hunter friends would hunt this one area. On November 15th, 2015, Tom and his hunting buddies decide to go hunt in this area. And they got a bit of a late start. They didn't get out there till about noon. So they decided in order to make up for lost time to use this technique that's referred to as a deer drive, where you have stationary watchers that set up on a line about 100 meters apart from one another. And you have a group of drivers that kind of corral any deer or any animals in the area and push them so that they go past the watchers who can take a shot at those animals. And so Tom, along with three other hunters, were made watchers. And they set up along this hillside where Tom was all the way on the left flank, which meant on his left, were no hunters. He did have a hunter 100 meters to his right, and then there was two other hunters all the way up the hill on the right as well, but he was on the outer flank of that line. And the three other hunters that were gonna be doing the driving were to his right as well. Behind this hill, they were gonna try to push the deer up and over this hill down to this line of watchers. After three hours and no luck, they haven't seen one deer, they start to also comment on the fact that there doesn't seem to be any wildlife at all. No squirrels, no birds, know anything. There's just silence, which is very odd for this area. And when you consider that this group has hunted this area for 55 years, 
they have a really good understanding of what normal looks like. And before anything happened with Tom, they were already talking about how strange that was. Also, one of the watchers who was right next to where Tom was, about 100 meters away, he recalled hearing a very distinct sound, like a whooshing sound or a snapping sound coming generally from where Tom was. But he didn't think much of it at the time, that is, until they got back to their cars after calling off the hunt because they had been unsuccessful, and everyone's there except for Tom. And they go back out, they're yelling for Tom, they're wondering, did he fall down? They're like, okay, let's radio him because everybody had radios. There's no answer from Tom. They're searching the area where he was. They start shooting their rifles into the air. They can't find him. And they think, okay, well, we don't know what he's doing, but this guy is super competent. He was healthy. Let's just go to the cars and wait for him. And so they're sitting at the parking lot, which is not very far from where they were hunting. And this is an area they always parked in. And this is an area they always hunted in. So they knew that Tom knows where they're gonna be. And so they sat there waiting and waiting and he's just not showing up. So eventually the hunters call it into the rangers that he's gone missing. A massive search is launched for Tom. I mean, they are combing this area. They got helicopters, professional search teams. They're looking in lakes, they're looking under logs, they're looking everywhere. And there's not a shred of evidence of Tom. They can't find his walkie talkie. They can't find his gun. There's no clothes. There's nothing. He's just disappeared. On the fourth day of the search, the FBI shows up and they get involved in the search, which didn't make any sense because why is the FBI getting involved four days into a search for an elderly hunter where there's no sign of foul play? Why are they getting involved? It didn't really add up. And all they would tell Tom's wife is that they believe that something was off about this case and that's why they were there but they couldn't elaborate unless more information came in but nothing ever shows up even though tom was a bit older he literally taught survival classes he was the guy teaching other people how to survive in the woods he also has been hunting in that particular area for 55 years how is it that he in no way was able to signal that something was wrong and that all these people including the fbi can't find any trace of him it just seems like something is off. I gotta agree with the FBI on this one. In 2013, 51-year-old Dale Stelling decided to take a trip from Texas where he lived with his wife and his parents up to Colorado. He was an avid outdoorsman and he had always wanted to go hiking and camping in Colorado. So he, his wife, and his parents load up the RV and they start making their way up to Colorado. On June 9th, as they're making their way to Colorado, their RV breaks down in New Mexico. Even though they were eager to get to Colorado, Dale saw that where they had broken down was near the Mesa Verde National Park. And he thought, well, we weren't planning this, but let's just stay here for a night and go check out the park tomorrow. Then we'll get the RV fixed and we'll be on our way to Colorado. And so they all agree, they stay the night, and the next morning they head over to Mesa Verde National Park. It was a very hot day that day, and Dale's wife was overweight and not very healthy, and his parents were very elderly. So when they got to the park, they ended up just sitting at the visitor center, and no one really wanted to actually go walk around. But Dale was an avid hiker, and he didn't like the idea of just sitting around all day. And so at some point, Dale just says, hey, I'm gonna go stretch my legs and walk this trail here down to the abandoned city ruins. There was the city that had been built into the cliff that lots of tourists would go check out. And so his wife and his parents, they don't bat an eye. They say, okay, we'll see you in a little bit. And Dale was off. Dale made it seem like it was gonna be a very quick trip. And so when he didn't return in two hours, his family decided to tell rangers and say, hey, you know, our, our husband, our son, he went hiking down that trail there towards the ruins and we haven't heard from him. We can't get in touch with him on the phone you know, can you guys go look for him? The Rangers actually were not concerned at all. They said that we've never had anybody go missing for more than a few hours here. It's pretty hard to get lost. You know, there's lots of tourists here, well-marked trails. Just give it a couple more hours and if he doesn't show up, then we'll go out and look for him. But after about an hour and they still hadn't seen him, his family really pressed the issue with the Rangers and they would go looking for Dale. And of course they can't find him, but they found a number of tourists that had seen him on the trail that he said he was gonna be on. They had even talked to him. He was a very energetic, charismatic guy. And they would say that he seemed like he was just another tourist enjoying his time at the park. There's nothing odd about his behavior at all. And he was walking towards the area where he had told his family he was going. While that information was certainly useful, they still couldn't find Dale. 
and they were really fighting against the elements on this one. You know, the temperatures were over 100 degrees Fahrenheit and had been all day, and Dale didn't have any water. So they really had a limited amount of time to find him. So within 24 hours, there's this huge search that's launched for Dale. And interestingly, in the first 24 hours of the search, a woman was at the park and was walking along the trail that Dale was on. And she remembers hearing a, a weak male voice yelling for help. And so she kind of looked over the edge. She couldn't see down below her. She was on a bit of a cliff, fearing that if she went to look, she might fall and become a victim. She went back to the rangers and said, hey, here's the area I was in. I heard someone yelling for help. You should go check it out. And the rangers said that actually we've been getting that report. We got that report yesterday. But when we went to look in that area, we can't find anything. There's no one over there. So while it seems very likely that that person calling for help was most likely Dale, we don't know for sure because they were never able to locate who was asking for help. And to this day, we have no idea where Dale is. There's been no shred of evidence to indicate where he went. He just vanished. If you enjoyed today's story, if you haven't already, please sneak into the Like Button's house and replace all of their salt shakers with sugar. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. So I'd love to get your reaction to these three stories. What do you think happened and why? And I'll do my best to get back to as many of you as I possibly can. If you're interested in learning more about the missing 411 phenomenon as documented by David Politis, then you should check out David Politis and his team at their YouTube channel, the Can-Am Missing Project. I've also provided links in the description below to all of their work. Also, I have a Missing 411 playlist that you can save and watch that as well. If you have a story suggestion for me to use on this channel, go to our subreddit, which is just Mr. Ballin. It's linked below. It's a place where you can drop your story suggestions. And if I intentionally use your suggestion, I will absolutely credit you. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram. My username is John. Ballin416. Also, I'm very active on TikTok where my handle is Mr. Ballin. So whether I see you on Reddit, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, some combination, just know I'm incredibly thankful for your support. And until next time, see ya.